these programs are distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. You may copy and distribute these programs free of charge. You may not sell them, and you may not alter them. These programs are part of a study examining the value of podcasting as a medium for medical education. If this is the first time you are viewing a program in this Optic series, send an email to jyoungmd at gmail.com with your name, position, institution, and city, state, or province, and country. Thanks, and enjoy the podcasts. This is our last lecture dealing with PRISM. And uh, besides, uh, we're, we're going to briefly uh, revisit anisometropic anisophoria when we start to talk about um, astigmatism, but that's a little while from now in, in, in the course. Uh, so after this lecture, we are going to say goodbye to uh, centimeters and deal only with meters. Some of these topics are not particularly practical, but they are things on which uh, you may find yourself questioned, and it's always nice to know what the answers are and why they are the answers. So let's say that we have a patient who, uh, for his left eye, requires prism. He requires five prism diopters base down OS and five prism diopters base in OS. And Let's say that we're asked to prescribe a single prism uh, at a single orientation that will uh, represent the addition of these two prisms. Now, how do you think that we're, that we're going to, to do this? Uh, before I, I give you the answer, uh, I'm going to tell you that there's a reason that I have chosen five prism diopters and five prism diopters, uh, and the only other choice that I could have reasonably made or that you could reasonably be asked is if one of the powers were four prism diopters and the other one were three prism diopters. Is that enough of a hint? Okay. The answer is, is that we are uh, adding vectors. So a five prism diopters plus five prism diopters is equal to the length of the hypotenuse. This is vector math. Uh, I hope it's not the first time that, that you're seeing this, but maybe it is. And if it is, then the uh, hypotenuse length uh, here is equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of the side. So 5 squared plus 5 squared is equal to 50. The square root of 50 is just about 7. Uh, you know, 7 squared is 49, but whatever, 50 is close enough. So uh, the net prism of 5 plus 5 is equal to 7, and it's going to be 7, pre uh, seven prism diopters oriented based down and in at an angle of 45 degrees. Now, if you ever wrote a prescription that looked like this, I can almost guarantee you that the optician is going to phone you and ask for, for clarification. Uh, but in the event that you are asked this question in some sort of a formal setting, uh, this is the way that you would approach the answer. And of course, the only reason that uh, I, I said that the, that the two sides have to be you know that, that the two prisms have to be five diopters, uh, five prism diopters and five prism diopters, or three prism diopters and four prism diopters. Is that is the uh, only ones that you can do the hypotenuse length in your head? Uh, five and five uh, equal to seven. Four and three equal to five. Okay, so this is uh, uh, something very non-quantitative uh, and a little bit interesting. Uh, we're going to do some math here. So on the left-hand side of the screen, we have a prism. And the prism is of a certain prismatic power. Whatever that power is, doesn't matter to me. Let's call it something. And we're going to subtract from this, geometrically, this square with parallel sides. And because it is parallel sides, the net prismatic power of this shape is equal to 0. So we're going to say something minus 0 is equal to something. So this shape, at the end, has the same prismatic power as our starting shape does. The difference is, of course, it's lighter. And it's lighter because it doesn't have all of this mass in the middle. If we continue uh, these iterations of taking out a zero from our prism, then we're going to ultimately wind up with something that looks like this. And this is a Fresnel prism. 
And the Fresnel prisms, which we encounter in clinic, typically as these sort of vinyl-y stick-on uh, prisms that we apply to the back of uh, patient spectacles who require prisms temporarily, uh, we see the, the, the little ridges in these prisms. And the ridges are the apices of each of the individual little prisms here, all these little apices, if you can imagine extending this in 3D sort of out towards you, uh, are going to be the ridges on the back of the Fresnel prisms. Nothing quantitative here, uh, just to understand why it is that we get this shape and why this shape works. Okay, uh, we discussed in our very first lecture uh, the idea of index of refraction. And we said that index of refraction of a medium refers, uh, the, the N of the medium, refers to its impedance to the movement of light. Well, it turns out it's a little more complicated than that. It turns out that the impedance is dependent also on the wavelength of light, and that short wavelengths of light get impeded more than long wavelengths of uh, light do. So that if we have a lens that is bending light, and we can take this, you know, not as a, as a lens with a converging formula and vergence and stuff we have to figure it out. Let's just take this as a, as a apprentice rule problem. That if we have white light coming in, and I know I've drawn this as lavender, but it's difficult to see white in a white background, so I've chosen this color. If we have white light coming in and striking our lens, uh, the short wavelengths and the long wavelengths will be impeded differently and therefore will be bent differently. And the short wavelengths of light will be focused anterior, uh, will, will be focused closer to the lens than the long wavelengths of, of light. If you picture this as if it were an eye, then the short wavelengths would be focused anterior to the long wavelengths. And we refer to this situation as chromatic aberration. In the eye, um, we uh, also have uh, chromatic aberration, and, and we can employ this clinically when we do the duochrome test. The duochrome test is when we show uh, the uh, chart to the patients and uh, we, we set things up so that half of the chart is red and half of the chart is green. And uh, in an emetropic, non-accommodating emetropic patient, the green wavelengths will be focused a little bit anterior to the retina, and the red wavelengths will be focused a little bit posterior to the retina. Of course, not really posterior because they'll intersect the retina and stop there, but if the retina were transparent, they would be focused just posterior to the retina. Now, I told you in the previous slide, that which I'll show you again, that... Um, short wavelengths get focused anterior to long wavelengths. And the examples that I've given are a nice short wavelength blue and a long wavelength red. The question is, why is the duochrome test green and red rather than blue and red? And the answer, if you haven't figured it out, is that the green and the red are dioptrically equidistant to the retina. So that for an emetropic patient, the green and the red appear equally clear or equally blurry. Whereas the blue is further from the retina than the red is. And if we were to have a duochrome test that were blue and red, if someone were emetropic, the red would be more clear than the blue is. So the green is chosen because it is equidistant to the retina uh, with respect to the red. So in an emetropic, non-accommodating patient, or uh, as I like to say, in an emetropic pseudophagic patient, uh, this is the situation that exists with the green in front of the retina and the red in back of the retina. For a myopic patient in which the image is being focused in the vitreous, the red wavelengths are closer to the retina than the green wavelengths. So if you show a duochrome um, image, you know, the half red, half green image, and by the way, the question that I ask patients is not which side is clearer, but which side has the darker, sharper letters. If you ask that to a myopic patient, uh, an uncorrected myopic patient or an undercorrected myopic patient, the answer that uh, he should give, um, if, if he notices a difference, is that the red has the darker, sharper letters and that the green is more blurry. So this is the case for an undercorrected myopic patient or 
an overcorrected hyperopic patient. For a hyperopic patient, let's say a mild hyperope who's not wearing spectacles, um, or a myopic patient who is over minus, and, and optically that's the same situation, the green will be closer to the retina than the red is. So if you've over minus the patient or under plus the patient, and again, optically that's the same thing, the green image will have the darker, sharper letters, uh, and the red image uh, will be less clear. Uh, so that if you're doing the duochrome test on someone and you want to make sure that you're not over minusing them or you're not under plusing them, uh, then you want it to be the situation where either both are equally clear or where the red is a little bit clearer and at least that way uh, you can feel sort of, kind of confident uh, that you have uh, not uh, over minus the, the patient, although some of them can still fool you. All right, this is an exciting moment for us. This is a time where we get to say goodbye to prisms and we get to get into the real business of ophthalmology and talk about lenses. Let's talk about how we describe the power of a lens. And the unit that we're going to use for this power is diopters. Now this is a unit that's distinct from prism diopters. Uh, this is the dioptric power of a lens. And as I promised you, we're going to get rid of the idea of using centimeters as a unit of distance. We're going to use meters here. The dioptric power of a lens is determined by two things. It's determined by the lens's shape, by its curvature, and by the index of refraction of the lens, and also the index of refraction of the medium in which the lens is sitting. So in this case, we have a lens, a glass lens with an index of refraction of 1.5 that uh, is in uh, the medium of air, which is an index of refraction of 1.0. And the radius of curvature of this lens is equal to 0 0.05 meters. We can calculate the dioptric power of this lens by using the lens maker's formula, which is delta n over r, or uh, n sub 2 minus n sub 1 over r. In this case, n sub 2 is 1.5, and n sub 1, the medium in which the lens sits, is 1.0. The radius of curvature is always given in meters, which is 0 0.05, so the dioptric power is equal to 10. Right, 1.5 minus 1.0 over 0 0.05 is equal to 10 diopters. Now, if we take this exact lens and we submerge it in water where the index of refraction is 1.33, delta n changes, so the dioptric power of the lens changes. n sub 2 minus n sub 1 is now 1.5 minus 1.33 over, well, the radius of curvature of the lens hasn't changed. 0 0.05 meters is equal to 3.4 diopters.